Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Our topic is Know Your Shelf, Getting Store Execution Right in 2022. This is a great topic. Uh, it's a perfect time to be discussing it, especially if you think about everything the industry's been through since the onset of the pandemic, um, all the changes in shopper behavior that we've seen, and then how those behaviors have created all sorts of new uh, execution challenges on top of the challenges that we already had, which were not insignificant. Um, we know that getting store execution right has always been super important, but in the coming year, it's going to really be probably the thing more than, than ever before, I think, that uh, separates winners from losers. And I say that because we've seen this rebound in customer traffic to stores at the same time as retailers' operations have become much more complex, they're more digitally integrated than ever, and all of that raises the bar on execution, and it's all coming together at the same time. Um, <clears throat> I would share one quick example that I really think highlights what's going on, and, and, and I would use Target as the example for that. Uh, the reason why is they provide pretty good disclosure of the mix between you know, in-store, online, digitally enabled, all those different pieces. If you look at through the first nine months of the year, Target said 18% of its sales were digitally initiated, but 97% of its sales were fulfilled by stores. So it's clear that Target stores function as many warehouses in much the same way as your typical grocer uh, who uses their stores for fulfillment of online orders, whether that's third party delivery service uh, or pickup. Um, but whatever, whatever way, it, it highlights this challenge of you know, knowing your shelf and then the concept of shelf intelligence, which then powers store execution, which is our focus today. So as we think about this topic, really at the end, we want to be able to leave you with this better understanding of what shelf intelligence is, uh, why you need it, how you can get more of it, uh, some of the tools available to do that, and then how to take action on that intelligence once you've got it. Um, all moving toward, you know, getting this uh, execution piece right or as close to right as is possible. Uh, our plan today is to look at the, the following areas. Uh, achieving customer-centric assortments to drive compelling experiences, gaining visibility into store-level execution, and fixing operational exceptions, driving category performance with real-time insights, um, through new technologies that look at shelf conditions, and then how, <clears throat> how AI can identify out of stocks, incorrect pricing, promotion, and merchandising. To help us explore these areas, I'm very happy to be joined by George Lowry, Sai Fahimi, and Abi Beniwal. A uh, quick, quick word about each. Uh, George is Vice President and Principal Analyst with Forrester Research. He's been with Forrester a combined 18 years, a lot of, a lot of good um, interaction with the industry during that time. Uh, Sai is Senior Vice President of Product Management with Symphony Retail AI. Uh, Symphony is a global provider of integrated AI-powered marketing, merchandising, and supply chain solutions. And then we're also joined uh, by Abi, who's co-founder and CEO of Retech Labs. Uh, Retech is a global provider of real-time image capture and recognition technology. And um, his company was just acquired by Symphony, I believe uh, around the end of October. So a lot of interesting things happening there. Uh, our plan today is to first hear from George. Uh, George is gonna hand things over to Sai, then he's gonna hand it over to Abby. We'll hear a little bit uh, from each on their unique perspective on, on what's going on and where we're headed. And then um, Abby will hand it back to me at the end uh, I'll kind of facilitate the, uh, the questions from the audience, from you all, and then uh, we'll have a conversation about some some stuff. And um, yeah, and that'll be it. Hopefully we'll uh, have a good good bit of time together this morning. Uh, one quick bit of housekeeping before I hand things over to George. We do um, ask folks if you would please take a survey at the end. We wanna know what you think of the content that was presented today. And um, we're gonna be handing out some gift cards. So. Uh, stick around. Uh, we'll get to that at the end. And for now, I'm going to uh, step aside and hand things over to George. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, everyone, for joining this session. Well, why does self-intelligence matter? Even before 
COVID came along, we had masses of challenges in order to create assortments that really mattered to a much more fragmented audience than ever retail had addressed or. And with an increasing number of new product introductions, line extensions, promotions, that made execution in the store harder and harder and harder, and not to mention disruptions in supply. But I think also what we'll see in this session is that people's behavior, their shopping behavior around grocery has changed too. And that's created even more work for people in the Suluka. Now, even before the crisis started, we were monitoring this is thing called the World Uncertainty Index. And there were, even before COVID, there were shortages, there were problems, there were tariffs, there were quotas. There were countries that could, might or might not be able to, to be able to supply you. So already this level, there was a kind of drumbeat of uncertainty and crisis already building up for retailers and making it hard for them to plan, but also re really hard for them to execute. If you don't perhaps have fabrics or footwear that's come, let's say maybe from Asia, because there might be some challenge in the, in the, the, the ports, or perhaps we're still, there might be a, a crisis around currency or around tariffs, then you've got to find something else that you can sell instead. And that creates a lot of execution challenges. And of course, many of you will be very aware, particularly in the US, of all the port challenges that there are. But I want to say that actually this isn't really just a US thing. It's actually worldwide. Case in point, uh, a lady called Michelle Bobman, who is the market editor for Lloyd's List, and you know they analyze everything to do with shipping, she testified to the parliament in the UK, I think last week, and she said one year ago, you were able to, to, to lease a container vessel for $25,000 a month. Today, it's $200,000 a month. I mean, that's just an amazing challenge to deal with. So regardless of everything we've seen around Evergreen already getting stuck, all the problems that we've got in ports, you've got that uh, immense sudden amount of demand unleashed and not the capacity in terms of shipping or handling uh, in ports to be able to, hand, to to be able to land it. Now, there's always been lots and lots of challenges in planning your inventory, particularly for retailers. A lot of people imagine that it's it's very easy, but it isn't. Uh, and the reason it isn't is because we've got demand variability. I talked a bit about that. We're trying to broaden the assortment to provide more choice for people because they're shopping online. But we're also trying to make it much more appealing to individual demographics. And doing that is very, very challenging. So that demand then becomes more variable because it's not just, we're not selling just to Mr. and Mrs. Average anymore. But we've also always had challenges around supply, uh, su supply lead time. Supply is inherently uh, more inelastic than demand. And in addition to that, We've always had problems around lot sizes, production sizes, multiple different sources. All these kind of things have affected the execution of the supply chain, and in particular, what we have to do in store, because we're right at the end there of a whole chain of activities and trying to, to touch up. Many people say to me, when visibility help with this, and I always have to chuckle because seeing that I have, let's say, athletic uh, shoes available to me in Vietnam is hopeless if I've already started my season uh, here in Europe or in the US. So it's not really just about that. It's also, and I mentioned this, that the level of, of challenge has been much increased by, a, so this happens, anybody who looks at this will see it's a map, happens to be of the Netherlands, and Belgium and Luxembourg, you think a small enough area to have a single, let's say, uh, DC or distribution center. Actually, what we found working with people was that the center of gravity for demand is jumping around all the time because it's much more volatile with people ordering through e-commerce. So you can see here the continuous replanning of that supply network. And this is something that's very different from, I think, what many, most of us have been used to in the past. Certainly when I was a youngster, I used to lease trucks and warehouses for three years because demand was stable. You absolutely can't do that now. And you probably don't want to because you've got on-demand storage and on-demand transportation that enables you to adapt more quickly to that changing environment.
But the other thing I wanted to really emphasize is that grocery shopping, the pattern of it has changed enormously. And part of it because of COVID, but part of it was happening already. All the CPGs are trying to get the, the consumers to move to a subscription model. And at the same time, I'd say the retailers are very interested to job on their private label and trying to compete more effectively. And, and at the same time, people would like to uh, either pick up in store or have their groceries delivered. They've got used to the convenience. I'm going to see some data about that a little bit later on. So, yeah, you can see some of these things. What are people going to be doing around their their uh, winter shopping this year? You can see changes in their patterns and their behavior. And you can imagine what the impact of that is going to be to know what we should have on the, shel on the shelf and to our execution in particular to be able to have uh, material or radio, grocery ready for people, perhaps when they uh, want to do a curbside pickup. So this thing about curbside pickup has added yet more work to people who were already, I would say, completely overstretched and stressed in what they were doing. So those labor shortages that we've been hearing about over and over again, um, they have come just at the time when we really didn't need them. Because even before COVID, the level of retail execution complexity was completely overwhelming, the amount of labor that was available. And it's one of the things that we've seen people more and more time to try and, I would say, empower the people that they have. One of the reasons when people talk about a shortage of labor, is there really a shortage? I mean, this kind of thing that we, we've seen this graph all the time, what it really means is that people are not prepared to work for as low wages, in fact, uh, are really uh, a, a function of productivity. So the question is, how do we help them to do all these tasks? And how do we help them with curbside pickup, for example, and with very complex end caps and displays that are really reflecting what we need in our more, let's say, customized assortment how do we help them to do that? They need to have the right technology available to help them. Yes, AI can help, but actually they need mobile devices that show them what to do and that prioritize their next activity and maybe tell them what's best for their customer, and what's best for the company, and perhaps even what's best for their bonus. Now, I mentioned that there's a lot of work for them to do, and it's at a time when facings and adjacencies matter much more than ever. We know that for years people have been applying algorithms that show very clearly that if you have, say, 13 facings of vanilla next to 12 of old cherry, it's not the same as if you do it the other way around. It's hard for people to get that right. They need help. It really makes a big difference, both to sell through, but also to replenishment. So whether you're in a traditional trade or if you're in modern trade, you need to have the right tools to help people to do a good job there and to get it right. It's very interesting that many replenishment problems are because people don't actually know what's in the store. They think it's out of stock because the planogram has been incorrectly executed. So these things are incredibly important. Uh, and I want to also say that it's not just about technology. It's about the people in the loop that helped to drive high availability. This is a case study from a client of ours, actually in Europe as a European grocer. They had the same challenge everybody had around hand sanitizer. One of the things that they did with their clever AI was that AI alerted people to do the right task, to stop the, the shelves correctly so that people would find the hand sanitizer that they had. So an important thing here is to think about how to release the creativity of people. To be sure, many emerging technologies have, have helped with this and things like RPA to take the boring work away. We talked about different types of AI already to help with the forecasting, but also prioritizing the tasks that people have. And I think it's not insignificant that recently, when we look at our surveys of what large companies are gonna spend money on, that for the first time, they're up there spending money on supply chain at the same rate that they have been with front office, with e-commerce and, and Salesforce automation. And so supply chain transformation, not surprisingly, matters most of all for retailers. Why? Because they're the on, the, the right at the end of all that process. So here are some of the questions that we get asked all the time. People ask us, 
will, will this inflation continue in grocery and what does that mean and how should we handle it? What should we do about labour? This little resignation letter here is just a prompt to think about the great resignation that we've heard about. Why are people resigning? Because their productivity is not at a level that gives them rewarding wages. And the third set of questions we get are really all around out of stock. How do I handle that? How do I prevent it? How do I anticipate it? How do I tune my supply chain better? For this short session, I, I took this material from these research reports. And if you'd like a copy, uh, please let me, let me know. Please contact me. Here's my email address. And I'd love to share that with you. And uh, thanks for listening to me. I'm going to hand over to Sai now. George, thank you. Appreciate um, appreciate the, the the context and the information that you shared. I think it's very very interesting. Some great trends that you highlighted. I'm going to take it a little bit further and dive a little bit deeper, in specifically uh, around uh, what we're seeing from a from a market perspective around retailer and CPG trends as well, and then bring it into specifically what it means um, for uh, on shelf execution. Um, as we all know, the retail industry is going through uh, one of the biggest transformations we've seen in, in a long time, maybe biggest in our lifetime. Um, George, you know, you certainly highlighted a number of the changes um, in your section, but this transformation can create some incredible opportunities uh, for the companies that embrace it and invest in the technology and the AI needed to accelerate um, their business and capture <clears throat> an unfair share of the market. I want to spend a few minutes um, walking through each of these. First one around digital disruption. Not only um, has COVID significantly accelerated the shift to um, alternative means of buying like online and click and collect, um, but it has exploded the amount of shopper data and insights that are now available at, at everybody's uh, fingertips that can be leveraged for improving analysis and activation and, and execution. With both um, increased supply chain costs and, and limited availability, um, in addition to uh, shopper uh, price sensitivity, it really puts pressure on the business to make um, really good decisions. This again is an area where leveraging AI around shelf intelligence can, can help um, optimize the category management and supply chain areas by providing better transparency and awareness of what is actually happening on the shelf, where the demand is, um, based on um, what is actually sell, um, selling on, on the shelf. The other, the other change in the industry is uh, that retailers are now competing with not just other retailers, but actually with technology companies. And that forces you to start to think much more like a technology company in order to be able to compete effectively. In fact, I would argue that the combination of one, the frontline uh, shopper data that retailers have, and two, the brick and mortar retail, the brick and mortars that, that retailers have actually offers a very unique competitive advantage if you're leveraging it using technology um, and, and enabling the business models through AI to power, um, power them. Uh, but more importantly, have a deeper understanding of your shoppers and what's actually happening in the stores in ways traditional technology companies uh, would not be able to do so. The notion of uh, real-time retailing is, is, is real, um, uh, driven by customers wanting instant gratification. You know, I want the product I want through the channel I want at the best prices. Um, it's, it's really a, a pretty dynamic environment with reduced lead times and localized trends. Here, again, with AI and having shelf intelligence facilitates this notion of real-time retailing to improve availability um, and optimize labor, labor <clears throat> efficiencies, um, not to replace people, um, but AI to help the labor focus in the right areas, as George was talking about. It can help with um, cutting supply chain costs, uh, guide, guide in-store teams to where um, to reduce the out-of-stocks, increase labor productivity, creating um, much more engaging uh, fixture displays. And then finally, of course, the shoppers, those, those unforgiving shoppers, uh, sh shopper trends that continue to accelerate with the explosion of digital uh, workflows. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but pre-pandemic, 13% of shoppers that were um, interviewed uh, were transacting through e-commerce channels. Now, <clears throat> post-pandemic, post 
um, that's tripled. It's it's a whopping 43% are either doing so or are open to it or willing to to um, to pursue um, the e-commerce channel. As a result, it's really paved the way for less loyal customers. Well, you know, you're willing to go to try different different brands or maybe um, due to supply chain sh shortages or better prices and willing to go to different shopping outlets um, because of those preferences or the ease of getting what you need. Here again, uh, with AI, uh, within Shelf Intelligence, you can help with loyalty, with retention and satisfaction, as Abby will talk about a little bit later. The, the, the good news is um, retailers and CPGs are seeing these opportunities and, and in fact, investing, albeit at different levels, um, in the technology and AI to get ahead of the market. Um, you can see on the left side, and the, um, some of the highest areas um, of current or planned investment in the next 12 months, adoption of AI going through, um, you know, retailers and CPGs are going from a state where it was analysis, analysis, you know, to um, predictive intelligence or even prescriptive intelligence, understanding contextual insights that are personalized for the role. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. We're working with retailers who have adopted our, um, what, we, what we have is our Cindy uh, Insights platform to understand and activate based on the sales and customer behaviors. Um, automatically, the platform giving them insights, telling them that sales are down, let's say, in a specific region because price-sensitive cohorts of shoppers are not responding to certain promotions or competitive prices or recommend personalized offers um, or assortment changes or changing your promotion tactics to really be able to drive that cohort of customers back into the store. Additionally, with technology and AI, it really paves the road for increased CPG and retailer uh, collaboration to drive um, better brand loyalty in store um, through deeper customer and shelf in insights and intelligence. The other trend we see around AI is that retailers and CPGs are investing in data science teams themselves and expanding their data lakes. So um, here, the tools and the solutions need to be open, um, need to be plug and play, and have to have the um, option of being deployed on their environment, um, on their data lakes to really power the insights. And all of this is driving a modernization of tech stacks and business processes in, in order to drive accelerated um, retail forces, things you see on, on, the, on the right hand side, digital commerce, uh, which is certainly here to stay. Um, this growth in e-commerce channel um, has shifted to direct to consumer models as we talked about, which means as a shopper, you have much more choice and you're inundated with options, thus impacting their typical loyalty biases. And it also has implications to store formats, inventory, and new business models um, like, like smart checkouts and hybrid store models. <clears throat> so what does this all mean from a category management perspective? Um, and we've hit on most of these, so I'll keep it short. Um, we got to keep up with the omni-channel shop shoppers and shopping uh, processes. We have to have a real good understanding of shopper dynamic segments by um, anticipating and predicting those trends. And then the next generation of agile mer merchandising and the integrated intelligence in a more cohesive cross-channel way, which historically may have been more uh, managed in, in silos. So let's talk about in-store execution and, and what we're seeing in the market. <clears throat> We're seeing um, FMCG out of stocks averaging around 8.5, 8.3% globally. Um, as we'll show, um, our AI-powered shelf intelligence with, with the image recognition tr uh, tracking can significantly improve this um, by a couple percentage points, while also having a more integrated um, solution into the full end-to-end -end category management platform can likely drive another couple percentage of improvements, and, and Avi will, will reference some of this later. On the second KPI, um, a customer filling a 10 plus item shopping list is, is incredibly um, only at 42% uh, today. Um, lack of um, availability of products in the stores lead to either product substitution or shoppers visiting multiple stores 
to, com to complete their, their shopping. And then finally, 50% of items on the shelves have incorrect inventory. Um, when items are out of stock, uh, you're missing out on maximizing the sales as it's affecting replenishment, resulting in, in uh, inherent on, ongoing missed sales. Not only that, but when customers can't find the items they're looking for, the problem spirals, um, combine, that, um, combine that with a survey that suggests 70% of customers we will switch to a competitor product if their desired item is not on the shelf. And 30% of cons uh, consumers will just leave the store altogether and take their business elsewhere. And we're seeing that translates to as much as um, about 4% of total sales for retailers. So, <clears throat> so how, how does AI uh, powered image recognition and shelf intelligence really help address, uh, address this through uh, better, better intelligence? Well, with an integrated solution, you can have visibility to the cost of out of stocks. You can have improved collaboration between CPGs and retailers. And if you have on shelf cameras or robots, it actually prompts more frequent and always on out of stock measurement and recommended remediation. Then, with improved connection to the back end systems, you can power improved planograms, better stock handling, and, and frequent more frequent forecasting through AI powered recommendations at the store level. And of course, with more frequent um, capture, it reduces on shelf availability downtime and drives bigger uh, basket spend and shopper satisfaction. So what's the future in shelf intelligence? Um, this is not intended to be an exhaustive list, but just highlighting a few areas. IoT um, will certainly enable better uh, actionability with continuous shelf monitoring, um, maximizing the performance and allocate store associates to more frequent replenishments to minimize, minimize out of stocks. We certainly see a big opportunity there. Uh, improve collaborations with better uh, data to manage out of stocks and in-store compliance. Um, combining with other data sets to potentially understand a more comprehensively um, store by store health um, and diagnostics like foot traffic or competitive geolocation shopper data. And <clears throat> frankly, we believe that a more integrated end to end merchandising platform um, will really help inform your overall forecast with really what's actually happening in the stores versus what you expect um, that would happen. And, and to um, highlight that or reinforce that point, um, this may be a <laughs> quick commercial for Symphony Retail, but um, uh, we, we have um, the market's leading um, integrated uh, cloud-based end-to-end and closed loop now with the partnership with Retech platform in the market. So you start with your category insights uh, to store clustering, to assortment optimization, shelf planning, planogram automation, and then finally shelf intelligence that tells you what's actually happening. And then that data is fed right back into your category planning suite to really help optimize your shelf, your planograms, and your assortments, which ultimately becomes the engine that continuously monitors, measures, and activates um, in-store uh, execution. Okay, before I hand it off to Avi, I guess, um, uh, who, who will dive more into shelf intelligence solutions, I wanted to um, reiterate the power of AI and computer vision to drive store automation and also the AI powered and end category planning across assortment shelf and planogram automation and, and insights um, that really power all of that. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Avi. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sayek. So uh, as uh, George and Sai covered pretty well, uh, all the trends and how the market uh, is going through a major change, uh, I'll focus on the how part in the sense of with all these challenges, uh, how can you utilize AI and computer vision technology uh, for your stores and for your insights? Um, as you know, by the way, with having you know 50 to 70,000 products in store, uh, with the COVID, with changing demand, with online store pickups, like George was talking about, one of the hardest thing is how do you make sure you drive the productivity and also transparency in the stores? Uh, so what we focus or the, the what computer vision part can help is 
Uh, one is captioning, means instead of scanning the uh, shelves, you can take pictures of it. Uh, with the computer vision technology, you can identify everything on those pictures, uh, create a prioritized list for your store teams. So they have a, uh, not only just work list, but prioritized work list, which can have the most impact with a limited labor time. And then last part, which is providing the visibility uh, for your stores, as well as your head offices, and for your category teams. So you can actually close the loop from how it's been executed, uh, what's the impact, and what else you can do, right? Uh, this is, by the way, has been a really uh, uh, changing the retail from how uh, the operations work and digitization work in the stores. Uh, just taking it to the next level, you probably heard you know, image recognition, which started mostly with product recognition, saying, hey, what are my products on the shelf? Uh, what we have done and where it's maturing to is, it's not just about the product. Uh, what else can we digitize and actually see in, on these pictures or inside your store, which can help you drive better execution? Uh, for example, you have products, you know exactly where they are in terms of planograms and their compliance within the store, uh, pricing, uh, promotions, which are on shelf for your customers. In addition, by the way, your fixtures uh, is, the, you know, most of retailers has a, different fixtures based on the stores. And knowing, by the way, what fixture limitations are, you can better plan your category ma management as well as ongoing uh, uh, promotions as well. So that that's what we've been changing is moving away, just not for product part, but anything and everything we have in these images and digitize it through the computer vision. Now, when you can actually take the, the store and digitize, every part of it, not just the product. It also expands the, the different use cases. In the sense, the primary use case for you know most of image recognition and computer vision part is the out of stock and making sure products is on shelf and on shelf availability. But you can take it to a whole different level in terms of compliance on the shelf, uh, in terms of making sure what items are plugged and in the wrong pricing. Uh, planogram plays a big role. You know, there is a huge investment goes in for category management and planogram planning. But if your planograms in the stores are nowhere close to the compliance, that investment will never achieve the ROI. And that's where we help, not just by the way, knowing where the planograms are, but actually help figure out how can you bridge the gap, what the cost would be. Uh, in addition, by the way, making sure that uh, you can maintain them moving forward. Uh, promotions is playing a big role, uh, especially with the digitization and the pickup part and knowing the promotions are executed, where they are in the store, uh, makes a big difference. And then last but not the least, is everything ar around labor and automation. You know, you can really uh, utilize and also create a different productivity for your store teams. Instead of scanning it once a week, you could actually have insights on a daily basis. Uh, and this is, a, by the way, game changing in terms of how you look at the store and how you evolve your store, which is, not just you know the customers are buying, but also is a you know pickup for online orders and everything else as it evolves. Now, uh, one of the other changes or the trend which we have done and you know really done well is you know if you look at the historically mostly dashboards are for numbers and data. Uh, what we have done is with all the digitization which has uh, taken place is how can we bring in all the visual Im Im images captured in the stores and combine the visual part and the data part together because not just it tells a better story, but it also help you uh, figure out the exceptions, where to focus, what's the opportunities and how it would impact. And I think this is a critical part because as you would know, most of the, the people and retailers and uh, CPG, there is a lot of data. So using the AI, using the visual part, you can not only you know, pass through it, but focus on what's important. Uh, I actually, uh, as we talked about the how part, I hope this was helpful. What I also want to show you is a couple of case studies, how some of the other retailers you know, and, and CPG has actually put that this technology and platform to use. So I'll just show you a couple of example of the few use cases. Uh, the first one I wanted to show you is uh, you know, one of the large uh, retailer uh, based in the U.S., 
where we have partnered with a company called BrainCorp. I'm not sure how many of you have heard. Uh, BrainCorp actually helped make these robots, which are fully automated in stores. Uh, as of today, they have you know probably 80% of the, the robots which are deployed in uh, retail stores and airports and other places. And uh, while the robot actually is an automated floor cleaning, cleaning uh, as you can see, it has a camera installed. So it captures the pictures and data in the store while cleaning. So that this one, by the way, it eliminates the need of scanning and going in the store. But in addition, you can take the data and use it for like, you know, digitizing the store and also creating a productivity in terms of how do you route your people and the task you optimize. In addition, by the way, the one part um, uh, one of the retailers have used is, is on their mobile in terms of helping people in the stores find the items. So you can walk and know exactly, even before you go to the store, where this item is and how do you, you know, uh, spend time in the store. Uh, so this has been a you know, very successful part and also how we partner in terms of <clears throat> the, the second example I wanted to show you is maybe a little bit more focused where the biggest challenge, uh, the one of the retailers, was is around how do you drive the on-shelf availability, uh, planogram compliance, and especially with uh, uh, COVID, what happened is there are a lot of items uh, which, you know, manufacturing issues, suppliers has to discontinue or were not available even to order for stores. In that case, a lot of tags got pulled. How do you make sure you bring uh, the store back to the place where it was after the post-COVID? And uh, so we actually worked with retailer across the U.S. helping uh, build a better devoid uh, program and making sure the products which are available and bring it back to the planogram and on chain availability uh, pre-COVID. <laughs> this is, by the way, uh, is more driven by automate in terms of productivity for employees and how do you make sure that the, the store can be not only bring where it uh, where the goal is, but also how do you maintain moving forward. Uh, this is also, by the way, another uh, great and successful story in terms of how to use the technology and computer vision uh, to drive the planogram compliance and on-shelf oil. Uh, the, the other study which I thought maybe just to share from CPG point of view, there is a little bit difference in terms of uh, in when the retailers are thinking of stores, if they are more driven by, in addition to insights, automation as well. Uh, when you look at it from CPG point of view, uh, there is a multiple part in terms of insights for their products and their placements, uh, competitive insights, as well as making sure where the trends and how do you uh, get the share of the shelf moving forward. So, you know, this example we are talking about, we work with one of the uh, you know largest CPG in helping them uh, drive their share of the shelf over the years and also making sure how is the competitive landscape is changing in terms of merchandising. You know, th there has been a lot of merchandising changes itself, uh, the pricing and the promotions and helping them figure out a strategy which evolve uh, with, a, with a plan moving forwards. Uh, and uh, I'll just close with this last uh, slide. Um, as I mentioned, you know, George and uh, Sai talked a lot about there are, you know, significant changes and those significant changes also bring significant opportunities. Uh, I think we are in an era, era where we need to look at stores and how we execute in stores in a very different way. And uh, the, it all starts from one, knowing your shelf. <laughs> Second is, <clears throat> how do you automate uh, what can be done in the store? You, you know, with a limited labor shortage, how do you create the productivity and the impact you're looking for? So this is the example which is driven by the way, uh, by Cindy, which is AI insights. So instead of you, you know, uh, somebody going through looking at all the dashboards and finding where to focus, you know, Cindy AI insights can help you drive the stores where you are having the sales uh, issues or on shelf availability issues or planogram issues where you can focus the energy. This is an example of a case study, by the way, where you can significantly drive the the sales and on shelf just by bridging the gap of what's there in the back of. Uh, uh, room as well as from the front and bringing them to the front. Uh, the planogram is a big opportunity. And, you know, as we all know, the balance on hand and inventory accuracy has been a challenge all along. Now it actually is a, at a different level and the need to solve it is also uh, is very important because supply chain, uh, as George was talking about and Sai was talking about, plays a critical role in getting the product to the shelf. Uh, with this, I'll uh, pass the mic uh, 
to, to actually I'll pass on to Mike. Pass the mic back to Mike. All right. Yeah, that's how it came yeah. across, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Thanks, Abi. Thanks, Sai, George. Appreciate it. Um, since you ended on a kind of a supply chain comment, I'm gonna. I want to go back to what George said at the start. These are a couple of macro kind of questions, but George, is there any good news about the supply chain that you're seeing? I mean, it's actually I've seen tons of good news. I mean, it's not particularly a retail thing, but lumber. You know, remember how short the supply of lumber was? It's got back to normal now. And why was that? It's because they shut down the sawmills and it takes a while to get them back up again. I've seen the same thing actually around meat. People were saying to me, well, we're not importing meat in the United States. Why can't I find, you know, beef or pork or whatever? Well, the answer is because they shut down the processing plants and the growers, you know, are finishing the animals to a certain time. Here in the UK, there's been a huge panic about turkey. You have turkey at Thanksgiving. We have it at Christmas. Been a massive panic. Will there be enough turkeys for Christmas? Turkey growers say there's plenty. <laughs> Stop panicking. We're back to normal now. So it's a question of getting back to normal. So I, 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 I people are saying these shortages will always happen. I don't think so. I think we're already yeah. seeing the whole system readapting. Yeah, well, we were going to have a turkey shortage in this country too, or that was kind of like the early narrative during the season. But then that just made everybody go out and buy turkey earlier than they normally would. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. There's a behavioral thing. You probably heard we had right. the same thing around right. fuel. They said there's going to be fuel rationing. So people who didn't really need it went out and topped up their car. The very smart companies said, actually, we're going to have a minimum amount rather than ration the maximum. Unless you fill your whole tank, we're not going to do it. And that was great because it stopped people doing that ridiculous panicking. Uh, okay, quick question, just um, again, big picture. This actually came in prior to the start of the webinar, but uh, I think this is a George question. Uh, where do you see the future of brick and mortar um, considering the boost in e-commerce sales that came in during and after the pandemic? I, I don't know if we can say after the pandemic just yet, because we're still kind of dealing with it's it, but yeah, where's, the, right. where's that pendulum settle in It's in 2022? Um, do you know what I think that they still have a place? Uh, you know, I I don't think people are going to get everything online. I mean, you know already, and I think smart retailers know this, that sometimes you just want it now. You don't want to wait for it. I'm going to to you know a funeral tomorrow. I need a black tie right now. I can't order it and wait for it to arrive. So if you can show me that there is one, perhaps at the end of my road, maybe even if I can reserve it, that'd be great or a party dress or whatever it might be that I, I need. And I think one of the really interesting things was that before the pandemic, if you look at what was really driving, I'd say revenue, footfall and margin in grocery it was perimeter categories and people, their shopping behavior, the baskets were getting smaller and more frequent. And we know from our consumer data, actually that's what people really want to do. They want to buy fresh, and they want to buy frequently, and you need stores for that. So mm -hmm. that's what I think will happen. Uh, so yeah, Mike, I that mean, one slide it, you showed with the 8.3% out of stocks. Yeah. Um, I was curious about that, and then we had a question on the same topic. But what, I guess it kind of depends. If you'd have conducted that study in March of or April of 2020, could have been like 60% out of stock. So. I guess what's that number look like on any normal year? Like what would normal look like if the supply chain wasn't disrupted and we're not in a pandemic? What would you imagine that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that that number is what we see in a steady state, right? And that's that's an average. And, and Avi, maybe you have some additional data points that that, that references it, but around eight percent is is what we're seeing on what's actually you know missing on the shelf. Maybe it's in the back back room, right? But it's but it's but it's not on the shelf. I, I actually so uh, to that point, Mike. What I would say is it also vary by category. So if you are in pandemic and you're looking at paper towel, your out of stock were ninety percent or hundred percent. And uh, some categories has evolved since then and came back to I would not say normal, but more close to. Uh, but the two main thing has changed. One is assortment has significantly changed. By the way. So for a short term part, you know, what retailers has done is took out
out deactivated products you know they are not in supply chain and to drive the own shelf they you know the assortment actually went down so uh, the customers don't have the same variety at least you know it's getting back slowly but there is a big gap so when you think of uh, you know out of stock you need to think of out of stock in terms of uh, assortment so yeah. yeah to help yeah to help the out of stock assortment was reduced so the out of stock can get more back to a little bit normal uh, i would still say by the way out of stock across us retail is north of 10% mm. uh, or more even um and as assortment increase it's going to be a challenge so it's a balancing act from my point of view i think you're exactly right about it. what people did was to reduce the assortment to stay in stock with some basics and yeah. the cpgs did that but the, I, the the kind of the number that everybody knows in the grocery world the kind of legendary number is 8% normally but for items on promotion it's more and i've heard people say it could be 17% uh, and since everything is always on promotion really isn't it in normal times beer shampoo you never see it when it isn't on promotion and you never see any category that doesn't have new items so yeah i think you're right it's between 8% and and 16 or 17% so it could be north of 10 normally yeah this is a, uh, a i think a sai and abi question but i mentioned at the start that um symphony just bought retech not too long ago so what's the how's that working where do you see the great the combination of that of the two companies where do you see the value being delivered well let me back up how is are you integrated yet and if you are where do you see the value uh, being delivered to retailers and over what time frame yeah I'll, I'll, i can start and abi you can jump in um so the thesis behind the acquisition was what I talked about on my last slide, which is a closed loop category planning solution, right? We, we have great um, solutions, great technology that takes you, you know, all the way through the assortments and macro and micro shelf. And, and, but, but, but what we didn't have is what's actually happening in the store. And what Retech does is really it closes that loop for us and is allowing us to say, look, we're forecasting the following things. We're recommending the following. We're using our AI capabilities to recommend what should be on the shelf or, or forecasting demand, all that stuff. But we didn't really know when, whether that, that planogram that, we, that was supposed to be deployed was actually being executed the way it was supposed to be. And, and Retech really helps us close that loop and really be able to capture in-store data and feed it back into our category planning. And I believe it's it's the only um, solution in the market that has that end to end closed loop um, uh, platform, and um, we're really excited about it. You know, um, we've been working with Retech for the last how long has it been? A year, or maybe longer, two years, on a number of opportunities. We know the team; um, they have great technology, and it's been a great great partnership. And we're now working on the integration of you know that that vision that I was just talking about. Okay. I'll be anything you want to add. Uh, I think Sai covered it pretty well. Uh, you know, the, the only thing I would add is that, you know, Retech brings a very complementary part to what Symphony already has. And, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, we can bring a more value for our customers. Uh, that That's the primary decision, by the way. And uh, for Retech, I think we'll continue uh, as, you know, working with the Symphony as well as, you know, focused on our, you know, customers to drive the bigger value from end-to-end -end point of view, as well as store digitization and productivity. So our focus and vision, you know, uh, sustain, you know, continue as we grow. Can you talk a little about what implementation looks like? Um, let's say I want, let's say I want to know my shelf, but I don't have any, I don't have any visibility right now with some of the advanced solutions like you're talking about. And, um, and I want to, you know, use cameras, whether it's on a, a device like you showed with BrainCore or Shelf Edge. What's what's implementation look like? How long does it take? How how long before I get valuable information that I can act on? Yeah, great. That that's a great point, uh, Mike, and I would love to answer that. So the the there's two parts to this uh, uh, as you think of implementation. The first part is yeah, you know how do you drive the like you know the computer vision for everything in the store. So we can stand up our solution in a very short time. So for US market, we have more than 500,000 products fully trained, ready for deploy. 
So we can stand up our solution from that point of view uh, within eight weeks and actually give stores, uh, you know, on a mobile and tablet to go capture and, and be able to work. Now, the second part, like you said, Mike, is more about automation. Uh, and the automation could be shelf camera and robot. And that could be a little bit longer path. Um, you know, as you can imagine, just deploying the robots in the store, uh, making sure operationally covered the shelf camera without interfering with customers. But, you know, our solution is very simplified. Give choice to retailers where they can use a different devices because not, not every retailer will go on one path or other. And, and it's important. It's important that we have the choice and uh, flexibility as we expand. And that's the way it's going to go uh, in terms of execution. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we got time for a few more. I want to jump around a little bit in the queue here because I've got, got one that I think is really interesting. Um, clearly, AI helps, but is it realistic to believe that it can be deployed in every store and every shelf? The, the cost and, and work to maintain it would appear to be potentially overwhelming and, and maybe large. What's recommended? Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll take on this uh, question, Mike. So um, there is a, when you think of AI, there's a multiple different part of AI. And uh, so the, like Sai was talking about AI from insights point of view means AI help figure it out, what's important, what you should focus on. That you can deploy on all the data, right? It's a data from end to end. Uh, the second part of the AI, which is computer vision part in terms of image recognition and what do you recognize in the stores. Uh, for that part, it depends upon the use cases. You know, uh, there are certain things you can do across the store. So for example, you can check promotions and pricing across the stores. You can check uh, the products in certain part and then other parts, you might want to do it in a different way. So it depends, the answer to that is, by the way, it does depend upon the the, uh, the store and categories. But what I would say is it's more important is what is the biggest priority? And I think you start from the growing part of the business or where you have the biggest pain to get ROI and then expand into rest, rest of the categories. That's what, uh, that's what the goal is. Okay. Hey, uh, Sai, so let's um, kind of start winding down here. But if I implement um, the Symphony and the Retech solution, and I think about that 8.3 number, where do you realistically think I could be a year from now in terms of my out of stock? So <clears throat> what we're seeing, I think I mentioned it in, in the presentation, we're seeing... Um, you know, one and a half to two percent reduction, uh, maybe a couple couple percentage point uh, reduction. So the eight point three coming down to you know six ish um, with the shelf intelligence solution. Because again, it depends on how you're implementing it, how frequently you're collecting the data, how you're activating that information. But we we, we it's not unreasonable to expect a couple percentage point reduction in, in that. The then then the question is. If you actually connect it into your end-to-end, -end, your assortment, your shelf planning, and your planogram, um, we believe that there's probably another one or two percent um, gain there as well. So I think you, I, I think, I don't know if you'll get there within a year, but I do think that you can drive a fifty percent reduction in your out-of-stocks um, if you have some of the technology that Abhi's talked about and and really being able to connect it into an end-to-end -end platform. And then this is kind of a, a practical question uh, for Abby. The, the BrainCore robot you showed with the camera on it, what's the the distance from the shelf that it could capture the, the you know image? Yeah, so that camera you saw is actually is configurable. So depending on the store format. Uh, so even that robot itself is actually multiple different sizes. You can imagine the club will have a bigger one size and area versus the grocery stores. So one, the, the robot, the different sizes of robot, and then the camera itself is configurable, which allows to be closer to shelf or farther, depending on the space available. So it can be configured uh, okay. for different segments. The shelf edge cameras have little batteries in them that last for practically ever. Is that how that works? Uh, it, so the, the one which are installed on the robot are actually connected to the power itself. So there is, but, but similar camera, uh, they are a little bit more uh, better quality because they're only installed on one robot versus, you know, if you think of edge camera, you had to install across the store 
so the cost has to be a little bit, uh, little bit more uh, restrictive in terms of making sure you can deploy it. Um, does this does this work for uh, fresh and uh, produce? Great question. So uh, for fresh and produce, I mean, the, the harder part is how do you tell is, is the apple organic or regular apple, right? Uh, so we have taken a little bit different approach in terms of, you know, one is depending on the layout, is the product where it need to be and using the price tag to figure it out what it is. Uh, so we have a, you know, creative and, you know, kind of our proprietary approach, how we can actually deploy it in the fresh and meats and other sections. Uh, with some limitations, as I mentioned, but uh, yes. Um, are there any privacy considerations with cameras in aisle capturing potentially images of people? Is that a concern? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely a concern. And depending on the country where you are, this concern is very big or, you know, or kind of a little bit less. But the way we uh, overcome that is you know, the, the technology has deployed where you can simply ignore the people completely, or even the pictures which are captured are not even stored, uh, and then it recaptures the pictures. So there is a, a multiple options there now, uh, which can absolutely uh, give the privacy needed. Okay. All right, guys, I think uh, I think that's a good place to end it. Um, I know I mentioned at the start that we we want to know what you think about the information that was presented. So. Please uh, take the survey. Um, we'll send you a gift card. Um, well, I guess you have to be one of the one of ten. So, um, George, Sai, Abi, appreciate it. Good insights into where we're headed and important topic. So, be in touch in 2022 and see how things are going. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yeah.